Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers and we're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues and today one that touches everybody's lives. Yes, we hear an awful lot about the plight of the rural hospital and the plight of to some extent hospitals in general and we want to explore that a little bit to see what is the extent of the problem and what might be some of the solutions. And we all better get this figured out. And we got the best guest that can talk about that. Absolutely. We'll have Patty Davis on today's edition of The Verdict. We'll be right back. Soccer has been such an important part of my life. It's been my life for 18 years. It is an amazing experience to be a part of the Big 12 Championship team in 2017 with the OSU Cowgirls. And looking back, it's one of the best things that has happened to me. I'm Lana Duke. I'm a medical student and I'm Chickasaw. There is a need for physicians in rural and underserved areas of Oklahoma. And that's where my heart is. I definitely want to stay here and practice in Oklahoma and give back to the community that has given me so much. And I want to make my family proud and Chickasaw is proud too. And ultimately make other people have healthier, happier lives is what I really set out to do. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. When I came to work for the ODVA, I started realizing the opportunity to take care of veterans. It's a powerful thing when you realize that you are taking care of people that made history. Working here is a calling. It's really, really important that they don't just come here to exist. We want to give them meaning to their lives. We try to make life happy and meaningful and fulfilled for our veterans. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As we talked about uh, in the open, our guest today is Patty Davis, the president of the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Patty did her undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma, got her MLS in healthcare law, uh, was a CEO of a small hospital in Carnegie, Oklahoma for a while and learned how uh, hospitals really operate. Uh, she then left for a, a stretch with the uh, Oklahoma Medicine, OU Medicine, then came back to uh, recently to uh, Hospital Association as president. She became president in 2018. She's been on the show uh, many, many years ago, and we decided not to try to go back and find out how many years ago it's been. But Patty, we're sure glad to have you back. Thank you. Well, welcome back. Well, thank you. Appreciate that, Mick. Well, there's a lot of talk about hospitalization and who's going to pay for it, and the insurance companies, and these giant organizations that are running our hospitals the cost of, of medical care, and you guys are right in the thick of all of those battles and those topics, so where do you want to start this conversation? Well, absolutely, and it's, it's important to know the Oklahoma Hospital Association is a trade association. Mm -hmm. 115 hospitals in Oklahoma are members, and so the role of the association is clearly about advocacy on the interest of hospitals, but we also do things like helping our hospitals prepare for changes in data and finance, we help our hospitals improve their quality and provide education for their staff. So we try to fill the gaps mm -hmm. uh, for our members to improve overall health care for Oklahoma. A lot of times I think we take hospitals for granted, but they're a tremendous part of the economy and big employers. They are, and depending on who you ask, we, we cite all the time that in the Oklahoma City area, health care is number two behind government, but clearly it's a major part of the Oklahoma economy. We have 60, 60 plus thousand hospital employees statewide, wow. so they are a major part of the economy. And you know, at the same time, Oklahoma, we have tremendous health needs and we have mm -hmm. some health challenges, so clearly hospitals are front and center uh, in times of need. 
are your are the members of the Oklahoma Hospital Association just hospitals or do you get down into having uh, medical professionals as well as members? Well, Kent, that 66,000 plus employees, that if you're an employee of a hospital that's a member of the association, you're a member of the association. I see. So that may include employed physicians, but it certainly includes medical mm -hmm. professionals that are the staffs of hospitals in Oklahoma. What trends are you seeing? Well, clearly in Oklahoma, the trend, you know, we're, we'll talk about later is, is whether or not the state will choose to expand Medicaid. But, you know, nationally we see trends about consolidation, about the small hospitals consolidating or, or being merged or acquired by larger systems uh -huh. uh, because it's really hard to be a standalone hospital. And within the metropolitan areas and other places, you even see consolidation that's going on there. I mean, if you look just south to, to Texas, you see what uh, Baylor Scott White has done in terms of merging two really large health systems. So I would say that's the trend that, that we see a lot nationally. And uh, so that's really an excellent so question. So fewer standalone entities out it's there. It's harder. Yeah. It's yeah. much oh, harder. I can imagine. There's way more regulation, and it's mm -hmm. very costly to be able to meet all of those mandates. So mm -hmm. if there's a way to do efficiency, you know, in terms of management, that's what it's about. Because we all know care given at the bedside, that's where people want the best yeah, possible. Yeah, that's where they interact. With that's the system, where they yeah. interact and they want the best trained healthcare professionals. They want the latest and greatest technology. Now, all the things that are required behind the scenes in terms of billing and compliance and all of that, that's where you really look to see efficiencies in, in, in terms of saving money. Well, you. In the early part of your career, you worked as a CEO in Carnegie, I think it was. Yes. Uh, running a hospital on yes. a day-to-day -day basis. Just how hectic a job is that? That's a great question. Thanks for mentioning Carnegie. It's actually the hospital I was born in. Oh. And so... Well, you, uh, you really well, you went up the ladder then. I, I mean, did go up the ladder. You did me. There was some I, interim, I wasn't there? Absolutely. Oh, okay. You know, I was a typical small-town kid that when I graduated from high school, I said the word never. I will never live here. <laughs> And then, you know, you graduate from college in life circumstance, you find yourself back. It was an absolute honor to be the CEO of that hospital. And I mentor a lot of young health professionals. I always say, if you get the opportunity to work in a small hospital, do so. I'm gonna tell you why. You learn how to do a lot of things because you don't have a massive staff. Recruiting is difficult in a small town, so you try to grow your own identify kids in the community they are good in math and science, help them through college, bring them back home. But a small hospital, you get to touch everything. And it's a tremendous learning experience for anybody that wants to start a health career. What was the single most difficult aspect of running a hospital, a smaller hospital, insofar as your job as CEO? Well, being CEO, clearly, you're the captain of the ship and you make a bad financial decision and that may make the difference between being open and being closed. So you really have to understand hospital financing, you have to manage your cost. A big challenge in healthcare period is workforce, having enough uh, nurses and others to be sure to provide the best possible care. So recruiting staff, making sure you have the proper staff there and then making sure that you're making the right financial decisions. Well, let me ask you another question related, I hope, uh, uh, telemedicine. Yes. Telemedicine is relatively new in the healthcare industry. I mean, I realize there's been aspects of it for a number of years. Do you see the telemedicine uh, aspect of healthcare as a plus for the smaller hospitals in Oklahoma from the standpoint of survival or a minus? It's an absolute plus and it's telemedicine has been around and it yeah. just continues to more. Started out in x-ray, I think. Right, and like I mean, that. back in the 90s when I was at Carnegie, we were one of the first hospitals that had a radiology telemedicine yeah. service and it worked very, very well. I think it's a plus because uh, in Oklahoma, there are over 400 telemedicine sites today and there are a variety of ways. It's not one size fits all. So we see smaller hospitals trying to link up with larger hospitals or larger physician specialty practices to be able to provide cost-effective care remotely through telemedicine line. Let me, let me just follow up on that one more, a little farther. Uh, what are the outer limits 
of the capacity or the capability of telemedicine. Uh, we started out, I think, early on in the early days, mm -hmm. it was just reading x-rays. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gone to uh, beyond, I guess, to uh, actual patient care. And, oh, totally. Uh, are there any outer limits to telemedicine? It's only limited by technology because in the early days... Imagination. You absolutely, you had to have huge telemedicine setups, you had to have telemedicine rooms, and now with the power of the iPhone, with the power of the iPad, you can do bedside care. I mean, think FaceTime for medicine with diagnostic tools, things yeah. like electronic stethoscopes, mm -hmm. otoscopes for listening uh, and, and looking in, in the ears and that sort of thing. So it's only limited by technology. The other beauty of telemedicine is the cost. It initially was hugely expensive. Yeah. It's still expensive, but it's less expensive and the technology has improved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as long as we have very creative people building applications, we are just amazed at the technology that exists. And used to, it was always in a hospital with a doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Now there's tons of home applications where patients' conditions can be monitored mm -hmm. in their home That's using amazing. telemedicine. Well, and, and I'll, you know, hold up my wrist here. Absolutely. A wearable. I mean, and, and this technology is probably in its infancy. It is. Uh, you know, even though I'm amazed what it can do right. today, I can only imagine five or ten years from now the type of, of, of medical um, uh, information that could be transmitted to a doctor uh, from a person's wrist. Uh, is that another asset for rural hospitals as, they, as we try to figure out how we're going to keep them more viable? It's an asset for patients, period. Because if you have a cardiac condition and you have a smart uh, watch that's sending you alerts mm -hmm. and you can link in with your doctor, I mean, this could save your life. Yeah, it can get you perhaps to the, the right type of physician earlier, right. maybe hours earlier. Right. And, yeah. and so, you know, when we talk about disruptors in healthcare, the wearable technologies are, but they're bringing a lot of life-saving technology to, yeah. to folks that otherwise wouldn't have it or wouldn't have access to a physician. Let me jump in and get us to a break. Patty Davis is our guest. She's the president of the Oklahoma Hospital Association. We'll be right back. You're watching The Verdict. law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, and our guest Patty Davis of the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Let's talk about rural Oklahoma and their plight uh, to keep hospitals open. Well, sure. I think it's important for your viewers to know since 2016, eight rural hospitals have declared bankruptcy. Six have closed permanently. So when you talk rural hospitals, you try not to lump them all together because we have some rural hospitals that are in regional, larger populated areas. We're talking the hospitals that are not in those regional populated areas, the more rural hospitals. 
So if you look in some of these communities, if you see a population that's dwindling, that's a challenge. Uh, workforce, I've already mentioned, recruiting back to small town America. You know, you try to bring your own people back, but the other thing is physicians age and in Oklahoma, primary care is in a real shortage, especially in rural Oklahoma, to recruit someone back or e even to recruit a brand new doctor to a rural hospital is very, very difficult. And our hospitals are challenged by that. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is when you recruit a physician, you wanna know about quality of life issues. You wanna know what's my spouse going to do? How good are the schools? How much am I on call? You know, who's here to share the, the burden with me? So recruiting can be really tough in some, some smaller hospitals. A lot of the challenge of our rural hospitals, as I mentioned before, about making right financial decisions mm -hmm. It's been, been very difficult because of the Affordable Care Act, as, as part of the agreement to get that passed, hospitals agreed to a cut in their Medicare payments in exchange for getting Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. Now, this wasn't something that our individual hospitals were asked, but no. this was something that was negotiated uh, by the hospital industry. So that being said, Oklahoma hospitals began taking Medicare cuts as soon as it was passed. Then in 2012, when the Supreme Court said states, you don't have to expand Medicaid if you don't want to, our state has such, at such time has made the decision not to expand Medicaid. At the same time, we were hit with budget shortfalls in Oklahoma beginning in 10, and the state budget started contracting, so they started cutting state appropriations <coughs> to agencies. As such, since 2010, hospitals experienced a 14% cumulative cut in, in state funds. Now it's important for your viewers to know when the state cuts a dollar of Medicaid payment, you also lose the federal match. And roughly that's for every $1 appropriated, usually it's two plus dollars that comes back to the state of Oklahoma. So all of that, meaning all of this change within the healthcare system because of the federal government's policy and because of our state government policy, our hospitals have seen massive financial cuts. Why this is so tough in rural Oklahoma is if you look at a typical rural community, you have a high incident of folks that are on Medicare that are over 65. You'll have your population that's on Medicaid, but then in a lot of small towns, they don't have a lot of robust commercially insured uh, folks living in the community. A lot of the businesses don't provide health insurance. And so for our smaller hospitals, they, they proportionately have a larger percent of uninsured mm -hmm. than the urban hospitals About do. what would that share be? It's around 38%. Okay. Yeah. So that's the uninsured share in, in a rural in, in hospital. Rural, in, in rural Oklahoma. Right. And right. so hospitals are, uh, I would assume a term you might use is under reimbursed. They're, they're not reimbursed as much as they should be. Well, I mean, if, if you look at, there's a federal law that was passed in 1985 by Ronald Reagan that the Emergency Medical and Active Labor Act, it's called EMTALA. There's a federal law that requires hospitals to provide emergency stabilization regardless mm -hmm. of ability to pay. We're yeah. glad there's a law. But there's no provision for the federal government to provide that care. So a rural community really mm -hmm. has to be very diligent in how they conduct their business because they have to be able to make it on what Medicare pays and what Medicaid pays and then they have to manage patients that don't have insurance when they need care in terms of how they manage that debt because many times folks are in minimum wage jobs and you know they just don't have the means to avail themselves of commercial products it's, it's just too expensive for them. So I guess the uh, original idea was that there would be a two-part solution. One, there would be a cut in benefits uh, payable to a hospital for uh, caring for a patient. But in return, there would be a corresponding increase with the expansion of Medicaid that would help even out the uh, financial uh, hole that was created at the beginning, is that right? Oh, you said it very eloquently. I wish I would have said your words. <laughs> well, don't ask me to repeat it. <laughs> Superfluous words. Well, <clears throat> and so here we are in Oklahoma with having uh, absorbed the first mm -hmm. 
reaped a part of that formula, right. the reduction in benefits, but we've not reaped the benefit. The hospitals have not reaped the benefits of what was expected to be the basic uh, massive reimbursement through expansion of Medicaid. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, let's well, talk let's about the go, legislative go session no, sure. that we just completed. Mm -hmm. How did it go for you? Well, we were hopeful that our legislature would find a way to draw down federal funds that are available to Oklahoma to cover our uninsured. We, we worked very diligently on trying to get that done. For the first time, we got a bill out of committee, which is something that hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. And the discussion is certainly at a heightened state of awareness. Despite that, we had a very successful legislative session because of improved matching funds from the federal government we were able, that, that flowed to the state of Oklahoma, we were able to actually get an increase uh, in our Medicaid rates when I've talked about the 14% that had been cut in the past. Uh, last October, hospitals got a 3% bump and, and doctors as well. This legislative session, they also added another 5%. Mm -hmm. We still have a deficit, you know, from where we were in 2010, but we're grateful to be increased instead of cut. So that was huge, and, and we are delighted that that occurred. Uh, but all in all, um, items that were on our legislative agenda moved forward very nicely. We think we had common sense legislation that, that particularly was not contentious. And so this was um, a good session for the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Well, we've been reading some in the newspaper about activities that are leading toward a possible vote by the people on expansion of Medicaid. Uh, if Medicaid would be approved by the voters in Oklahoma to be expanded, uh, what effect would it have on your members? There's nothing out there that could have a more positive effect on our members than Medicaid expansion. The smaller hospitals as well. Absolutely, yeah. uh, because when, when we are looking at an approach, I mean, l literally, we wanted the legislature, we still want the legislature to fix this. Yeah. But we've been waiting a while and you know it's like almost a decade and you're looking at every year Oklahoma's health ranking. I mean we were 43 now we're 47th and I know this is something that the mayor here mm -hmm. uh, you know has cared about improving yes. the health of Oklahoma. So when our health rankings are slipping and Oklahoma now ranks second highest in number of uninsured in America you can't improve your health statistics with that many people that are uninsured. Because what happens? When people are uninsured, they don't get preventive care. They wait until the condition is really difficult and dire. And then they show up in the emergency room with a very costly condition that's difficult to treat or very costly to treat. So nothing would improve our hospitals, financial plight, especially the rural hospitals, more than expanding Medicaid. As a business, and that's what hospitals are in the business to provide care, but they also have to be open as a business to be able to provide the care. If you say, I'm going to invest $1 to get $9, that's a good business decision. Mm -hmm. We don't have much time left. Should people be optimistic or pessimistic about the future of, of healthcare? Well, the people will get an opportunity to decide this if the Supreme Court determines that the initiative petition language is, is valid and can move forward. If the Supreme Court decides that, um, and they will be deliber deber deliberating uh, June 18th, if, if they say it's a go and we pass all of the legal hoops, the coalition is certainly going to be out there mm -hmm. promoting, take a look at yeah. Medicaid expansion. Yeah. We have a website, it's oklahomansdecide.org, and we want people to get engaged because healthcare is not Republican, Democrat, or independent. When you need health care, you need health care. And when that happens, I'd love to have you back on and you can talk about the repercussions of the Supreme Court decision. Absolutely, and thank you for having me on today. Thank you, uh, appreciate it. Kent and I will have a final word when we get back. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car? Bottom line, it's not okay.
Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I really think people are so unaware of the number of kids waiting just in Oklahoma. And I think if more people knew that those children were out there waiting, you know, I think that just by the way we live our lives and the people we talk to, that, that maybe we could help encourage adoption from Oklahoma. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. We had a really nice show with Patty Davis today. You talked about the Oklahoma Hospital Association and what's important to them. Yes, and of course, uh, wrapped up in that is an explanation of a bunch of uh, problems mm -hmm. of hospitals, both big and small. And uh, uh, she did an awfully nice job in explaining what the uh, problems are and what the possible solutions are. Well, it's, it's complex. It is. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we in government always talk about, you know, what are, what are the unintended consequences? <laughs> and it seems like in the healthcare industry, anytime you do something, there are unintended consequences. Yeah, <laughs> lots of risks. Somebody's going to bring that up. And then so, you know, so you have all these people in, <laughs> that are elected leaders. Most of them don't have medical training yeah. trying to figure out the consequences and the unintended consequences. So we need experts like Patty that can kind of uh, help figure all that out. Indeed. Yeah, we'll have another good show next week. I hope you'll join us then. Uh, we also have some website information to hand out to you. You can get more information about Patty's Association at, at www.okoha.com. And we have a website, theverdict.tv. You can log on and tell us about a guest you'd like to see on an upcoming show. That's going to do it for Kent Myers. I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week right here on The Verdict.